My name's Dawn Daylight. I was born in 1947 in Ipswich. So that makes me like about 66, 67 next year. And I love to colour my hair. I like to be different. So you might look up there. There's a couple of pieces of artwork. I come here to the elders group as one of the participants in the Murray Connect group. And I also write and I sing. So that was just one song that I wrote. It was called Our Spirit Runs Free. And I also write stories. And I wrote this one, but I'm going to play a little bit of music in the background. It's called Up in the Manhole. My brothers and sisters of ten would go up in the roof. They lifted the hatch and scuttled around like rats inside the hot tin roof. Brother Charlie would sing out to me, Go away, Dawny, you're too small. I think it was because I was a girl. I wasn't allowed to go in the roof. My sisters, Carol, Margaret and Shirley and Kathy and myself would hang around with the boys and some of the others like Joey and Brian. They lived not too far away from us. We lived at Churchill and my mother was given a property in the 1940s. So when she had her 10 kids, there wasn't a lot of money around and she was given a property with cattle. So she took care of the cattle and she did the best she could to rear her children. Well, the ants were like marching soldiers. So we walked across the paddock and we'd spend a lot of days and a lot of time by Jeevan Creek. And it's an, a mission that was open in the 1940s. And in the 1930s, 1940s, my mother and father were trying to get married and had to ask for permission. They had to be exempt and the government was always asking them and saying that they had to follow the rules of the day. So my father was exempt from the act in the 1930s. And so he and mum were allowed to get married and they were able to go into town. So this house came along, Mr Daly gave mum the property to look after. So we sort of did the hard way. Well, the yabbies would come out of the hole. So we lived off the land. We tried to make do with the best we could find. So we had yabbies, eels, freshwater fish. So the yabbies would come out of the holes and we'd dig for them. So survival in that day, in those days, um, that's what we had to do. So the yabbies came out of their holes and swing on the piece of meat and into the tin or our jam tin they'd go. We'd pack them up with our jumpers and into the nets. The boys, well there's another story. It's another story. One of the boys, I think his name was Errol. I won't say his uh, last name because he's deceased. We were all really small, like seven and eight and a whole lot of the kids that were um, from the mission days were allowed to go into town in the earlier times. So they were able to assimilate into society. And so the kids, we grew up together and some of them are around, in, even in this area here, some of them are still alive. But our life expectancy is, is not supposed to be very long. So this, this stormwater drain that Errol fell in, he actually disappeared and we didn't know where he went. So that if you can imagine a whole lot of the Murray kids standing around at a storm drain. And so we were told, you know, you go for a swim. If you get drowned, we'll flog you when you come home. <laughs> well, Errol fell into the drain and he disappeared for some seconds. And we didn't know what to do, but he came out. Luckily he came out, he went under the ridge just a bit of a washway and came out the other side, lucky for us. Well, the storm, storm drain was gushing with storm water from the heavy rain. Oh yeah, I remember the swelling creeks. Well, the others came down the track with our lunch and snack and we'd spend all day by Demon Creek. That was one of the mission places, Demon Creek in the early times. 
when uh, a lot of Aboriginal people were removed from their homelands and their place of belonging. So they were rounded up and put into different missions. So Demon Creek was one of the missions and I believe there's a book out, it's called The Unforgotten Missions and Demon Creek was one of the places that we grew up. Well the Murray people, the Aboriginal people, Aboriginal people are called Murray people in um, Queensland, Koori in New South Wales and lots of other similar names but all people from around Australia have their own name. So in, in Queensland we're either called Murrays or Gurries. The Murray people came from all around and we'd spend most of the time by Deben Creek. Well there was a trucking company that uh, used to come in and take the sand away and I'm talking and I'm writing these things down because it's, it's like those places, the creeks, the dams, the water holes, the lagoons where we used to swim are no longer there, they're no more available for us. So this trucking company used to come in and take the sand away and there were little birds, the little birds used to put, make their nest inside the banks and uh, because this big trucking company used to come in and take the sand away, the birds no longer had their homes, the banks would decay. And I remembered when we used to walk along Demon Creek, Demon Creek also had its own cemetery where people were buried. I can't tell you how they were buried, but there was an Aboriginal cemetery out at Demon Creek. If you go out to Perga today, Perga Mission has its own cemetery where a lot of people, probably my age and a lot of the older generation of people, have been asked to go back to Perga and be buried, their resting place. Well, they make, this trucking company made the banks decay so little birds no longer had their nest. And we used to call them little chip chips or chirp chirps. And they were beautiful little birds, but we used to try and get them before the trucks come. Because if you didn't, they'd go in the truck, the sand would go into, uh, either into Ipswich or somewhere to make new roads for the Amberley uh, Warwick Highway. Is anybody from Ipswich? So you know a little bit about Ipswich? You know it's a little bit like that? Well, that's exactly how it was. So I'm going to read this because um, I've actually, my car was stolen last night and uh, I had a bit of trouble so I don't really have my reading glasses, my proper ones. Mum, or Carrie Daylight, as all the Aboriginal people gave her name. Her name was Caroline Nine and she had ten kids. Um, she rode in the saddle, tall. She was a great horse and stock person. She would ride along from dawn till dusk, collecting a calf or fixing a fence. Heading down the track, her and the dog, she'd whistle or call the dog to round them up, round the cattle up. And she'd, she'd come home at night time after being out all day and feed and cook for her kids. Well, the brothers, Ronnie, Teddy, Louie, Charlie and Keithy, some of them were stockmen too. I think um, Teddy was a horseman and he had his own trotter. He was the first Aboriginal man. He's since passed on. He uh, rode his own horse at Albion Park in the earlier, I think, 80s. And because of his love of horses, he actually died in the stable beside his horse. And then Ronnie, my brother, he died at, uh, in... Um, Canberra, he was playing football, but he was too old, he was 45 and he had a heart attack on the football field. Well, the boys along with their mates would play marbles from day in and day out. I'd hang around with them and try and play marbles. I played cars in the mud, it was one thing I really loved. Climbing trees was a high for me. We made cubbies up in the trees, in the mulberries, and eat mulberries all day. The fruit from the tree in our cubby. And I fell out a few times and I ended up in hospital when I was a kid. I used to want to run with the boys and swim with the boys and jump into the water when the creeks were flooded. So I learned to swim in the dirty old muddy water. And what they used to do was, um, when the fish, and the dams were flooding. We used to make the water muddy and murky and then we'd try and catch the fish with our hands. So we'd either hit them over there with a stick 
or just catch them until they had to come up for oxygen and that was one way to catch fish without a fishing line. Well going to school I had this friend, her hair was red, so cheeky, I could tell she didn't like me, Diane was her name. I knew she didn't like me but she had a nice side of her and I think that's the thing about people, you don't judge them by their cover. Don't look at somebody and say, oh, you know, she's got her hair. But when you're a kid, you don't really see things like that. Later on, we became friends. I think she was 11. Her mother was good to me, and Diane saw me probably just before she died. She became a nurse, and I went to a convent as a, uh, one of the early Aboriginal girls in the 1960s, 70s, taken away from my mother and father and put into a convent. I was sent to this convent to become a domestic, working for Smitten's three pounds a week, a couple of bob, not much, I remember well. How these years and the journeys I've come reminisce of the fun, the kids, the laughter, and all, swelling water, muddy drains, flood creeks, storm and rain. Yabbies, jam tins, smelly meat on the line. How these times have changed, walking along the dotted line. I actually, that's one of the sto one of my stories. I was fortunate enough to go back because I had very little education when I was uh, in primary school because I spent a lot of time with illness, sickness, as um, a lot of us did when we were growing up in the really hard, harsh times in the early times. So my mother and father used to have to get the water brought in from uh, Ipswich and bring it in by truck. And then we'd have a big tub, one big tub, so everybody bathed in that one tub of water. So we did have a lot of sickness, we did have a lot of school sores, and we did have head lice and a whole lot of things. So I would spend a lot of time in, in the hospital, at the Ipswich Hospital, um, with early childhood sicknesses and today I wear um, hearing aids because I've got um, a percentage of hearing loss. I don't hear so well without my hearing aids. In the 19, 2000 and, um, oh sorry, in the 1980s um, I wanted to become a health worker because I knew that somewhere along the line I could help other people. And so I went to Griffith University and I went over to um, Morningside and now they're at uh, um, South Bank. So I ended up getting my Bachelor of Arts and became an artist as, as some of my works up there. And last year with the uh, uh, Centre Care people and Novotel we put an exhibition on with a lot of the artists like Karen's one of our mob over there, Busy Anna. And we were fortunate enough to sell a piece and I went over to Montreal um, somebody, one of the CEOs saw it and it was in Brisbane and they moved them up to the Sunshine Coast. So we're lucky enough and fortunate enough to have the opportunity to still learn, even though we're getting on in years, we still need to be cared for and nurtured as we get older. And I think that's what the Murray Connect Group does for people my age and people who are. We get lonely when we live on our own, so we've got to find that connection with our community mob. And I think that's what we do out of here. And I was just so lucky to be here because I think this is my second year in, within this. Um, this one I called, it was calling at noon. One more story. Um, I called it Myths and Legends, but calling at noon. A long, they remain in my memory, all the things that I remembered and people say, oh, but that's not true. For today, had I not kept these within me, my understanding of life and the Aboriginal way of life would not be the same. I belong to the beautiful culture and the identity of my people. Some passed on, some have passed on stories and some come from all areas. We are connected to the land and to the dreaming. No matter who you are, Aboriginal, doesn't matter where you're from. My belief is when, we, when our people tell or pass on information, stories, we need to cherish these. 
and treat it with great respect. Because if we don't keep on our, our memories, those stories will be, our connection to the land will be lost. The, jo the journeys we have come can be difficult and challenging for all. The best and most exciting experience and occurrences would be the, sp the stories that have been passed on and also my connecting to the land and having that understanding, like looking for water. We use a piece of wire to look for water and the water would be there. You know, you'd go and look, that's where the water is. And then we'd dig into the creek so we knew there was water. Um, sorry. So when you, you don't have to have a university degree, I believe that. I mean, I couldn't write like this until I started to go to university and become educated. And becoming a health worker and my experience at Kangaroo Point which gave me the bridging back into to education because I left at grade 7 school but I only had grade 4 level of education because of my early childhood illnesses. One day I found an old biscuit tin. It was filled with negatives and luckily I went to university so I loved photography and I started looking at my mother's old negatives when my mother passed on. And I thought, this is wonderful. I found these beautiful pictures of people standing near the old house, down Deben Creek, down at Berry's Lagoon. And all these people were, you know, they're all passed on now, but they were, had this connection to the land because they went to Deben Creek. They went to Berry's Lagoon. And a lot of these places were of significant to Aboriginal people. So one day I found the negatives and I put them into, uh, in the dark room. I went in there and I thought, this is good, I want to be a photographer. No good, I, I didn't do so well because the photographs of the Aboriginal kids made them look really, really dark. Children were dressed in old clothes. The boys wore what looked like trousers cut off with the knees. The girls had haircuts, myself. I can't tell you, that, I can't show you the photos, but we had haircuts that were basically like a, somebody put a basin on her head and just went around like that, like one of the Stooges. Um, these pictures brought back many memories. Even though they were old, I was able to identify myself, members of my family and places where we had played as kids, like Deben Creek. The pile of old photographs say much about the person I'm about to describe, as the best part of her life was of great character, courage and understanding. They disclose many fond memories of her sons, daughters, grannies. I vaguely remembered her footwear and the way she carried herself proudly. She appeared connected and contented in her past life. I began to think of all the things I wished I had said had I been able to say them when she was here. Time has passed and much too late to say the things I want to say. I'm actually talking about my mother. I wanted so much to see her again and sat silent to hear her voice. I was sitting in my bedroom and I bought a house with my ex-husband who's passed away and I actually saw a vision walk across the lawn. and. I didn't imagine it, it was my mother. I wanted so much, so much to see her again and sat silent to hear her voice. The sun was setting and, and drawing cold towards night. When I thought I heard a voice, I wasn't imagining it was my mother. I knew it was my mother. Though I had not heard her, an echo sound was calling my name. I thought it a little strange and hadn't heard a car pull up. Perhaps I was imagining things. Sometimes you do imagine things because I really wanted to see my mother because my mother, my mother didn't abandon us. I don't know and I'm still looking at government records at the moment to try and find out why myself and my two sisters were removed from my family. A figure appeared as I looked out. 
It was a slender bill in a small frame. It crossed the lawn from where I assumed the voice was coming. I could still hear my name, thinking, who could it be? How do you know me? I wasn't frightened or scared, but meant more. I was so curious. She came at a time when things were not that pleasant. I was not very happy in my life. It was one of the same kind I had seen once before, hair silvery, short to the shoulders. I imagined her facial features much like I had seen many times before. They were very distinct of the woman I had known and had acquaintance with years ago, some time ago. The voice had a connection to the old tin as the photographs were hers. The tin was of significant and one of fond memories. Children had romped in the long grass in the paddock because we didn't have motor mowers, we had cattle and we had pigs, so we had to make do with the grass being cut by cows. The tall gums remind me of ghost gums. The white shades of bark blanketed each one as if to keep the warmth and cover against the cold night's air. I recall all the games we used to play. We played on those washed out dirt roads with our hands and we used to wag it or try to wag it from school but my brother was a stockman and he'd chase us with the whip and make us go to school. <laughs> we played on the dirt washed out roads all day throwing stones. Games of hopscotch were so popular as were the rain filled puddles and sat and made dams with our hands or make mud balls. One lot would sit over one bank and the other would sit on the other bank and we'd put a piece of mud on the end and roll it up and we used to play so he could hit one another. I recall all the games we used to play on those dirt washed out roads all day. We had two teams, one over the bank while the other tried to draw the first blood or mud. It was a challenge with a piece of mud and a stick. One of her photographs has families down by the creek or lagoon. I remember it as kids, we'd go down to these swimming holes, they would be flooding and we'd swim and try and, try and jump on a rubber or tube, as that's how we used to learn to swim. The fish were plentiful and there were ways we'd try and catch them by using a piece of wire. A fishing tool was used to chase the fish and give them a crack over the head till they were dead. Sometimes there were mullet, freshwater type, or perch. The eels were much slippery. They were little tiny things. I used to try and get into the cracks and we'd see them. I used to try and pull them out by their tails, but uh, they were a little bit slippery. We had trouble trying to catch them. So many might think this was cruel, but we learned how to live the Aboriginal way, but necessarily for survival. We were taught to survive in the bush. It seemed we were taught the Aboriginal way and how to live. We were taught to make use of what was available and what was in season. When berries were scattered along the ground, we'd rub them just to collect all the dirt off them and make sure they were clean. Some were so small we could hardly find them. We used to also collect prickly pear, and I think now today you can find prickly pears in, in some of the fruit shops. And they had needles in them. We used to rub them along the grass to get the sharp prickles out, otherwise we'd get them in our tongue. The long grass down the track, the creek at times, a place where you could go and hide or run in the long grass. I felt something special. I call this snapshot. I felt something special about a particular picture I held. I said if I thought if I sat and held a photograph which was in the tin, she might come again. I sat on the bed wondering if she would come along the same path because I used to always take my mother to bingo at Anala. She always loved bingo. And when I had my little girl, she used to come with us and she'd lay under the bed, underneath the table, 
and watched Mum and I play bingo. The path went the path went between the house and the tin, the shed, which was beginning to collect moisture. The sky was changing colours from blue, sometimes mauve, to an almost purpley black. Things might have been different had I been outside where I could have said, who are you? How do you know me? I remembered hearing a voice. I wanted so much to just once more to see her. I'm hoping she'll come again in my new home. I lived in Nala. The house is cold, no covering. It's the housing commission. I lived in a house, no covering on the floor, just like the old tin. Cold and needing some protection to keep the photographs filled with warmth. Yet there is a chance she'll be there once more for me. I've yet to hear her voice or be given some indication that she might be there to see, see me. Above all else, the figure of a woman, of this woman, would, be, would have been much older, her hair much thinner and grey, her features changed, because my mother died when she was in her late 70s. Her hands were evidence of hard work and labour and probably some inner flexibility in her fingers. Her sight would almost have been gone and would have difficulty in hearing the trains or the sounds of children. Because in the early days, we used to, if we had to walk to school, we'd have no shoes. Sometimes we'd go to school with no food. And I don't, I don't think that you could say because we were removed, we were ne neglected. We weren't neglected. We weren't neglected children. I've learned so much from this woman. She's been in my life, yes, even nursed and fed me. She has given me love. Although her life was one of hard work and at time frustrating, her heart was open to all around the connection between the tin and the photographs was that they were both her. She has given me strength and has passed on knowledge from long ago and has guided me into the person, the woman I am today. Her voice and appearance will always be with me. I still have the photographs, the negatives and her old camera and cherish them dearly. Thank you. I'll sing a song. Um, I'll just sing one song, I think. Um, I don't know where I put my mouth open. What's that? Oh, yeah. Must be getting blind. Well, I did my hair last night because I thought I felt special today. Even though I woke up at half past one and my car was pinched out of the yard. And I said to my friend, you better come with me. Come and find my car. Well, it was actually her car. So in the older days, I think that's probably why my mother and father had 10 kids, because there was no TV. <laughs> and um, I used to hear a lot of people playing musical instruments. You know, they'd make things with uh, kerosene drums, big drums and try and make their own musical instrument, their own entertainment. And I always thought, later on, I'm going to do that, I'm going to play music, and I'm going to sing. This our spirit runs free. Always was, always will be. Though it's not the same, we can create again. She's waiting, waiting for us to see. the road. 
breath For she gave us birth White man's facade has been built along our way We cannot deny Attempted genocide Attempted genocide Oh, come And see our spirit runs free Our spirit Our spirit Still run free I used to hear the nuns singing. You'd see them walking along and they used to come and let us out at night time in the morning, make us go to church at midnight for Easter. worker and uh, working in education, I just retired from my, um, I was a tutor, Aboriginal teacher road in Nanala, uh, Casa Ridge, and also worked in Aboriginal health for uh, seven and a half years as a health worker. And I had been lucky enough, I call it lucky because there was only two Aboriginal people that were studying at the time at um, Griff Griffith University and I was able to afford to go over to uh, New Guinea to see uh, how the people in the highlands and in the villages, how they did their health work. And I came back and I thought, yeah, that's what I want to still do is take care of our mob, take care of our people. And uh, the health department was changing at the time where they were going to put the lay workers where we used to go into the homes and to uh, you know, to weigh children, to do uh, haemoglobins, blood pressures, and giving health education uh, talk on the ground, like the grassroots people would walk around into the parks. So I went with people like Aunty Gloria Beckett, Aunty Jessie Budby, and uh, Leslie Van. There's a whole lot of us. We used to travel from, I used to travel from Ipswich to Budrum and over to Strabo Column. So we were driving driving but we were also walking a lot with uh, the ports and the nurse we'd walk behind the white nurses they'd walk in front and I thought oh well I've had enough of that nursing stuff but because I didn't have the education I wasn't a nurse I was just like the lay person who would carry the ports and we were like the bridging the people that were bridging the gap so the nurses and the health workers could do their work um, on the grounds with our mob and I thought oh that's good I've had a go at nursing I had a go and I wasn't a nurse but I was part of a health team and then I went and I started because I become become really interested in education and I wanted to do more so then I went to university and got my arts degree and I just found that writing and music and expression is what I really love and I think that's what's keeping me alive for this for this long today, and having people like Karen and all the other, all the other mob that we we connect with here. Thank you very much. That's um, about all I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Um, you got any questions first? I could ask. Any questions? I know you. 
Come on, fly, Matt. Give me a hug because I did it when you first started. Hello. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your story, Ali. Yeah. Beautiful. I like to tell my story because I think sometimes we. It's more personal if the person is personal and can give their account and reflect on their their generation of time when when I was growing up and what it was like and not being at home and not you know being removed from your family and going somewhere that's foreign and then you're expected at an 11 year old girl to go into a kitchen and carry big saucepans and big trays and wash these big sa saucepans and all that and uh, to be paid three pounds a week and when I went to the government to try and get my uh, my money that was put into trust because I'd been there for a very long time so we were 11 going on to 12 and then we went into this orphanage convent and uh, didn't have much collect, um, connection to home again until we were in our 20s so there was a whole whole for me lost and I'm not angry I'm just writing at the moment I've got a journalist working with me and we're actually trying to sell a story um, to one of the channels to see if they'll take the story on and um, who knows yeah but thank you everybody thank you thank you oh any question no hey? Yeah, I can play one more, I think. <laughs> I think they stole my shoes when they stole the car. <laughs> Their obligation that go hand in hand our fall told us our dream time they told us our dream time they told us of our totem do you know your totem? they told us of our land but they told us, they told us our dream time. They told us our dream time. They told us our dream time. We have obligations to our old, to our young. But they told us, they told us our dream time. We need our old folk. They are our family, they are our friends. They told us, they told us our dream time. They told us our dream time. They told us our dream time. That's our dream time. Thank you very much. Thank you.